Hi, I'm Professor Rod Van Meter from Keio University's Faculty of Environment and Information Studies, and we're going to talk about my definition of environment and information. So, what's a computer? You might think of a computer as being a box that takes in numbers and, well, it spits out some other numbers. And it's just this isolated thing that exists away from the environment. But in reality, most of the computers in the world interact with their environment in some way. We can call this environment and information, or environmental information, and in Japanese we call that kankyo joho. So, what kinds of things are we talking about? Well, there was a famous researcher, a guy named Norbert Wiener from the middle part of the, the 20th century, who created and named a field called cybernetics. And cybernetics at the time meant dealing with control systems and information in the environment. So for example, this is a modern system, a modern approach called uh, a PID, a proportional integral derivative kind of device. And what does it do? Well, it's controlling, for example, a factory, or it might be controlling your part of your airplane, or, or any of those kinds of things. And that happens over here on the right, where we're changing the, the system itself. But then we measure something about that information, and we feed that information back in this loop over to here on the, on the left, this place where you've got the sigma symbol there. So there's sensing that's going on, and then here in the middle we're doing some calculation. And as that calculation happens, in this case it's three terms, a proportional term, an integral term, and a derivative term, but it doesn't really matter what that is. There are three phases to this. There is sense, calculate, and actuate, or control the system. Now you might see other diagrams that include four or five phases in this, but you know, three is a good enough place to start. This is what you call a control loop. And you can do this using information. So this information actually controls the system for you. Now, let's look at an example in the real world. This woman, Margaret Hamilton, this is her standing next to a printed copy of the source code she was responsible for creating. She created all of the flight software. Well, she led the team and wrote a big chunk of the software for it, for this. This is the command module of the Apollo 11 system. And she wrote and led the team that developed all of the in-flight software for the Apollo landing missions, from the, co from the command module to the lunar module on the, uh, on, on the entire program. So that's an example where computers were used in the real world to control a real system. So we got a landing, or a, sorry, a takeoff like this, where you're the rockets headed for the moon, and then a little while later, We've got the landing as well, and so that landing process happens, and all of that was un under uh, control of software written by uh, Margaret and the team that she led. So that's one example of how computers work in the real world, right? And that happened in the 1960s. Another one. Let's talk about a different type of information. You might recognize this, and you might think that you know what this is. You might call this a radio telescope. Well, that's a group of uh, KO researchers. There's President, uh, there's uh, June Barai right there in the middle, and some of the other members of the WIDE project, including OSAN from the National Radio Astron or the National Astro Astronomical Observatory of Japan. You might think this is a radio telescope, but also this is a radio telescope. Not just one of these dishes, but the set of them. This set of dishes collectively receives radio waves and they combine those radio waves in a process known as interferometry. And that interferometry is a way of making a higher resolution image using the, this uh, process from these separate antennas. Do any of you all recognize the uh, Professor Bowman here. She's now a professor at Caltech. She was a postdoc, I think at Harvard at the time that this was done. You might recognize some of her work. This image. This image is the first image that was taken of a black hole. So you know this you know, information, you know, this uh, image around, around the black hole here. 
Um, you can see the black holes in the middle. This, that black hole is about one light hour across, way up in the center of this image, and this image is 1,500 light years across from a galaxy that is 55 million light years away. So it's a little tiny thing. How did they get the resolution to do that? Well, they used this process called interferometry, and they did it at the scale of the entire planet. So they created an interferometer, not just between those two dishes that were standing next to each other, but in a, among a set of dishes that spans the entire globe in a process called very long baseline uh, interferometry, or in Japanese, cho cho kisen denpa kan shouhou. Right? Now, here's the overall process end to end. They collected the data from, from these antennas, and then after they've processed the data, they've still got five petabytes worth of data left. That's a lot of data. Combining analog and digital data into this and ultimately leading to this final uh, image here. Right? That's a whole process end to end. Now, if in fact you have quantum information, quantum entanglement, you could actually go even further in improving the resolution of a system like that using a technique developed by uh, Daniel Gottesman and, and his collaborators. Now, we're not going to have time to talk about what quantum information and quantum entanglement are, but again, this is an example of how the information can be used in the real world. So, ultimately, there are three types of information. There is analog information, which is waves like this, and they're continuous. There is digital information, which is zeros and ones, uh, just however you want to structure the data. Those are the kinds of computers that, that you're probably thinking of when, when we think of the computers we use. And then there are quantum computers and quantum information in which the information that we uh, deal with is actually a set of complex amplitudes that help us build on techniques called superposition and on entanglement. And using that, we can process information. So there are these three major paradigms, but the, the analog, the digital, and the quantum. And what I want you to understand is that in the environmental world, environment and information, we are talking about the combination of those, the interaction of those devices and that information with the real world. So that's my definition for environment uh, and information, environment and information, or environmental information. Tom Joho. And I thought I'd leave you with uh, a picture that I actually took I hope you like my picture. See you in class.